Uh, it's a terrific honor uh, to have the opportunity to introduce uh, Denise Scott Brown as our guest lecturer tonight. Uh, born Denise Lakowski, who first studied architecture in South Africa, and then at the EAA in London, and then finally to the States to study in the planning department at UPEM, where she obtained her master's degree in city planning. As an instructor, she taught again at UPenn, US Berkeley, USLA, Yale, uh, among many other academic activities. In 2003, uh, she and Bob Venturi uh, were visiting lecturers at the GSD Harvard. When I proposed <clears throat> to invite her to lecture tonight, I was obviously aware of, of, of the whole woman in design, Pritzker Price affair. Uh, and of the opportunity that having her here would, uh, would be to manifest publicly the departments and the school gratefulness for the involvement of the students of the GSD in these and other, other social and I guess political issues as a sign of vitality uh, of the school that cannot and should not remain like proudly resting in a limbo. No? Uh, as if we were not affected by so many changes. Some of them dramatic, but some of them exciting too, that the world is experimenting and affecting deeply our idea of architecture and our ideas on what an architect is or should be nowadays. So thank you for doing all this stuff. But I have to confess that this was not my priority. <laughs> but Denise herself, um, her personal legacy, as architect, a legacy that changed the way uh, we look at what is out there, transformed by her vision in an immense and, and richful source of inspiration. Learning from Las Vegas. It's impossible not to associate this wonderful title with Denise, or Denise with <laughs> Learning from Las Vegas. Was first published in 1972, re viewed in 1977, uh, and, and it was an outcome of the, a studio led by her and um, Bob in Yale University in 1966. It was immediately translated into Spanish, I have to say. It was the first translation the same year, thanks to the wisdom of Ignacy Sola Morales, brother of Manuel, that received a tribute last week or two weeks ago, I don't remember, in, here in this room from the Department of UDUP. Um, the book is, as we all know, one of the fundamental texts of architecture of 20th century. This is the most simple phrase <laughs> that I could invent today. Now, for those of you that have not, please do yourself a favor and read it. This is a text that opened the door to many new practices and ideas today actively incorporated to our teaching and to our understanding not only of architecture, but landscape and urban design and, plan and planning. No? For example, see the excellent um, exhibition being now uh, prepared just out of paper. And I mean, I was walking, I was saying, it could be easily um, titled uh, Learning from Airports. No? So, so the, the impact is immense. I cannot resist the, the opportunity of introducing Denise to confess the impact that the book had in me when I was a student, much more young than now in, in, the, in Spain. And I was really, as many others, not satisfied with the kind of narrow-minded way of understanding postmodernism that in Europe, and especially in space, paradoxically focused in a kind of dogmatic and pathetic uh, vindication of order and tradition that literally reproduced the language of our fastest leaders. So for me, it was a great discovery to, to understand that uh, uh, through this book, that there was a completely different way to frame the issue of, of how we were trying to overpass modernism. And, and, um, <clears throat> and I think that it was one of the reasons why I became fond of American culture, architecture, and cities, and made my dissertation on the other side of uh, the bureaucratic side of American culture, the tower and office, the work, and that brought me first to Columbia and now to you. So, so in a way, Denise is responsible of having you, for good or for bad, of having, <laughs> having me here in this moment. But let, let's, let's uh, 
uh, finished more seriously, saying that the niche interest in real life and its manifestations, and Las Vegas is re a really extreme case, soon through this book became integrated in a decisive collection of books of the 60s and 70s on architecture with their focus on cities. Architecture with their focus on cities. Uh, cities academically, for, then academically forgotten, like Los Angeles with Rainer Banham, the city of four ecologies, like uh, later on uh, Rem's uh, special vision of New York with the Lirius New York and, and obviously the nice book on Las Vegas. Uh, that, that both, the three of them gave a kind of decisive step forward, bringing the city and its complexities to the focus of architects. I mean, the, the, and these three books say, in a way, to resume, this is what we have, we all have made, the, the real city. This amalgam is the true matter of our time, the matter we have molded and that we will have to mold, deal with, operate with. We have to make it all from within, being part of the very same matter. I think that this idea changed completely the, the way we understood uh, modern names and the role of, of architects. So uh, I don't want to lose more time trying to introduce other ideas. I just want to, you to join me in welcoming Dennis Scott Brown. Thank you. for your wonderful welcome and thank you too for what women in design have done to make my old age happy. <laughs> but the Pritzker was a source of much pain for me in 1991 and that kind of went away, um, and I got on with my, my life and my work. But really, with the petition, who needs the Pritzker? <laughs> that's, my, that's my prize, that's my reward. And just... <laughs> and, and just think what it will do for architecture. That's partly what I want to talk about. Um, I've called it Mayhew's architecture, and I'll tell you why later, but Mayhew's study of London was a datum for the, um, 1835 as the, as the Industrial Revolution started. Um, I think this petition is a datum for architecture in 2013, and that's why I hope it will be very carefully and cleverly analyzed to draw the most from it possible and to go on as well. Um, but I want to ambitiously um, also describe my datum, if you like, um, and my education and work and how these have related to the development of architecture as I see it um, over a long life whose pattern becomes clearer because it's getting near to the end of a career. Um, but then there's, as I say, architecture's datum, as shown in the petition, and showing where we are now. And my aim is to have you think about your situation and your datum. Um, I want to have, give you food for thought for thinking about your careers. Because when I was in your position, um, at the beginning of my career, I used to complain a great deal about um, the, the confusion I felt, lack of structure in my life, I used to say, lack of structure. Um, it took me out of South Africa because I didn't know what the hell architecture was, I felt. And um, to England where I got religion, you could say, um, <laughs> which was good, but I went beyond that and I feel a lot of English people didn't. That's why they think we're the Antichrist because they have a religion about modernism, uh, the ideology, um, the ideologues. 
Um, but that is one of the things that I probably shouldn't have worried about, that confusion. And a wise mentor to a young person can say, be patient. You don't have to see everything at this point. Why would you? Why wouldn't you be going into the unknown at this point? And so you know, part of what I should be doing is telling you my experience and you can learn if you feel you can from that experience. Because in the end, it seems to me, I used to say to Bob, as we were having all these troubles with getting work, be patient, it's a long, low arc for us. We'll never have all the work that, you know, some people they have little work and then a whole lot of work, but then they're also out of fashion, and ours is being more like this. But I also see mine as three curves in, on three continents. And this confusion, as it seemed, now seems to nest very well the one in the other. And on each continent, I was being educated in a time of confusion. Um, in South Africa in the 40s, the nationalists had come to power and apartheid was installed. My university was in uproar. Um, unlike the German universities, which went under to Nazism, they fought. They fought very bravely. And, you know, Mandala, Mandala was associated with my university. And um, the, in, in England, there was a socialist government, and there was a lot of rethinking, a lot of idealism. And then there were all the mistakes made, and then the Smithsons thought about life on the streets and changed architecture in that way. And then I got to America, and there was so much decorum. And there were bobby socks and sloppy joes and... Um, you know, and um, Republican politics. And what was what was it about the university? You know, why were they so polite? And then, within two years, it was an uproar again, and <laughs> felt more familiar. So, I want to talk quickly about those three careers. You could say. Um, sometimes I feel um, it's maybe I'm a different person on each place, but I hope I get together to be the same person. And I've been guilty of getting people from the, ones, the one experience to fight with people from the other experience um, for me to learn what the differences were and see where I was. So I induced a fight between Norma Evanson, the historian at Berkeley, and uh, Aldo van Eyck, which was not kind, and it was, but it was spectacular. And I did learn about <laughs> where, the, where some of the troubles were to help me make, the, make sense of starting in Africa and going on. And so I, in a way, started from the south and then went north and then went west and then went further west. And that's the kind of career pattern that you'll see in there. And if I say what was important in Africa, there's so many things, but I think of my parents and the fact that my mother grew up in wilderness. Literally, we were ethnics in in the wilderness, from Eastern Europe to Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia, and the Belgian Congo, and my beautiful grandmother, who looked like a Gibson girl, with her, you know, at 18, with her hair and all of that. The next picture you see, she's in front of an open campfire, which was their kitchen, with a big old iron pot that you find all over Africa, cooking meals. Um, and so that background of wilderness was part of it that I've been very happy to have. And um, also my university with its uproar and its interesting um, teaching and all the refugees from Hitler that were in Africa at that time who were my mentors mainly. If you see the list of people I thank, they're mainly refugees from Hitler. And then modernism, my mother studying architecture and she is in school with the people who brought the revolution for modernism in the early 30s to Witz University, my university. And um, when, when they were very young, they contacted Le Corbusier. And there's a letter to them from Le Corbusier in 1936 saying, can you find a creosis, that is a rich client, in Johannesburg, who will bring me there and I'll come and work with you. And of course the war came, but those people were wonderful architects. 
and one of them um, designed our house. So I grew up in an international style house, which has been very formative. And the people who say we're not modern are all wrong. We really are modern, and we are updating modernism as others have before us, the Smithsons, and I, I would say also Alva Alto, Joseph Frank, who you may not have heard of. Um, but that's been an ongoing task, updating modernism, and we see ourselves within that. Um, Africanism, um, the, the, the strong feeling of why should English people feel that they can be in South Africa expatriates and say they know the right way and we colonials are crude and we have the wrong way and their landscape is the pretty one and ours is the ugly one. And you see, I used to see as a child English people looking at a little bit of the felt like this and saying, it, this could be Surrey. I say, well, why does it have to look like Surrey to be beautiful? What's wrong with the felt? And if you know the landscape of Southern California with its kind of gray khaki color, it's that and it's incredibly beautiful to me. So long before I got to Las Vegas, I was thinking about what's wrong with our own local landscape. Um, I was very in involved in the, the question of, the, of racial justice, but also the artistic side of the culture clashes. Not only the artists coming from Germany and interpreting African landscapes, and bringing kind of German impressionism to um, doing African um, uh, uh, kind of tribal architecture and landscapes. But um, there were also the African reactions to their... So that um, some traditional African beadwork is now covering not gourds anymore, but Coca-Cola bottles. Again, very important for me for Las Vegas to have had that background of like that stuff, that very impure mixture of cultures. And um, the whole social housing and how South Africa problem. Are you still hearing me? <laughs> yes, I, I seem to hear the Mac, uh, good. Well, this, in South Africa, um, apartheid, but they also built housing. More than one city, Johannesburg, built more housing a year than America, the whole country built a year. And by a lot. And of course the differences are many, but begin, becoming involved in the issues of social housing and what was needed from Africa. And then um, I talk about my but my father he was a developer and get the feeling of what was developing and how it was developing. He, um, he, he walked to New York and said, I, I think 6th Avenue is going to be a feeling which later economics. The, yes, this one's not, but I'm going to need this other one too. Yes, okay. Um, so, uh, my father's outlook on how cities grew became part of what I could re react to when I took courses that architects don't take at Penn in regional science, which is an economics discipline, which produces a fine gossamer, of, gossamer pattern of relationships on the land, and which really, you can, you, can under, you can interpret what you see in an aerial photograph in terms of some of that, and I've found that's a very important addition to functionalism, not only for urban design, but particularly for architecture. Um, so I had many mentors, and I had, um, at, at that stage, as I say, many that came from Europe. Um, then when I got to England and I went to the AA and um, brutalism was uh, questioning in the same way Jane Jacobs and then Herbert Gans questioned urban design and urban planning. Um, Harvard started its urban design school in 1956 and they said there was great rejoicing. Um, now at last we have the legislation that allow our we architects to do our very best. We'll be able to do what we know how to do. We'll be able to rationalize the environment. And within two, week, two years, they had Jane Jacobs on their case. 
And it was horror what architects wanted to do to the environment. Um, and the same in England. And the people in England who, were, who stood for that were um, the, the, the new city builders who took people from the slums of the East End and put them into housing that they would love to be in. You know, wh why we would, what's wrong with our giving them what we would like to have? Why would we give them less? They felt the same way in South Africa. Why would we give Africans less than we want? Let's have single family houses for Africans. I think they were probably right and that my criticism from the point of view of wanting veal radios was wrong. But for all that, that was part of the, we want to give them what we love ourselves. And of course, then you study sociology and there are other ways of thinking. But um, so that was the, the fight there. And in a way, that formed me. The notion of looking at um, the streets of, of London and the, the life of, you know, there was a book called Kith and Kin in East London, which talked about the, the life of the streets there. And there was a book called um, Street Corner Society, another one that came out of America. And I think this is what influenced that movement to a considerable amount. And I found more mentors. Um, Arthur Korn, another German refugee teaching at the AA, an old communist. And um, I, st I t telling, started telling him about my life lacks structure. And he started taking me for coffee one morning a week at a little Austrian cafe nearby, Debris it was called. And he used to talk about his life of the November group, and I used to talk about need for structure in my life. And these seem to be parallel conversations that I suspect helped us both. Because I came out of that with a lot of passion and a lot of questions. And then um, started, um, I went back to South Africa, Robert Scott Brown and I, who'd been in love in South Africa, um, he joined me in London, and we married in London. We took a course in tropical architecture in the middle of the London snow in the winter. And um, then we went home and worked for about a year, and then we came here. And everyone knows that if you're a really good architect, you want to study urbanism, because all the work was urban rebuilding, city rebuilding. And Le Corbusier focused on urbanism. And so I came to study, and Robert came to study, city planning in America. And Lou Kahn was on the list and, of teachers, and that was important because Peter Smithson had said to us, Wherever, whatever you do, you must go to Penn, and you must go where Lou Kahn is. So we got there, and we discovered that um, Lou Kahn didn't teach in planning, whatever the catalog said. That's called hype. So we went to our student advisor, Dave Crane, and Dave Crane came out of this place. I've written a paean of praise to Dave Crane in the book called Urban Design that was published from here a couple of years ago, what he stood for. And Dave Crane said, stay with us, stay in planning, because you're going to learn things that you need for going back to Africa. And he was the one who pointed me to regional science and to these and urbanism and developing areas and courses like that. So I say, if it hadn't been for Dave Crane putting me in planning school, there would have been no learning from Las Vegas. So the biggest influence on his desire to help me help Africa was American architecture, the influence we had on American architecture. So I, we studied a lot of social sciences, and it was the kinds of questions that I had returned from Europe. I should say we also went traveling in Europe, and we hitchhiked and camped and slept in tents, and then we had a little car, and we worked in Rome, for a little while, and we formed friendships and we formed um, uh, relationships with other architects. As we all grew, we were very important to each other, and we still are. I worked for Giuseppe Vaccaro in Rome, and um, he had his office in his house, and his wife was his business manager, and there was a baby, 15 months old, who used to go in a little wheel wheelchair under the desks. And we'd be arguing with the grupo, and suddenly we'd, we'd hear all this noise, and the baby was in the drawing basket. And so we were doing babysitting and all that. Well, she's now a professor at Rome University, and we've gone for years and years to teach for Carolina in Rome. That you should have that experience, and you don't have to do it all Americano in big hotels. You can do it camping and 
working if you know, we didn't work formally, but we managed to work. And it's, it's something that you, you will live on for many years. The way Khan, rather, um, um, Korn said he lived on the experience of the November group the rest of his life. I feel I lived on that experience in a very large way. So now, um, but at Penn, that was that, but there was also Crane, and of course there was Lou Kahn, who had more urban experience than the people who followed him, because he was involved in the, in the planning revolution that happened in Philadelphia in the 40s. And um, I, I evolved a way of teaching studio there from the planning school studios, which was all to do with group work and research and design interchanged. And that is the way I ran the learning from Las Vegas studio and every other studio. And that is, is what now has influenced research all over America. And it's also influenced the way you teach here, because now you have team studios. And where in the beginning, it was only individual work. And of course, you need both. One, one can't go to the other extreme either. But for all that, um, uh, uh, those influences were very important. And then one other thing is that um, Robert and I were told by our teachers, you really must see the real thing. You can't just depend on the pictures we show you for architectural history, for example, or learning about modernism. You have to go. And then South Africa was so far away. So if you went, you went for a long time. The only people who stayed longer away were Australians, and for the same reason. Um, and the other thing was, you better go quickly, because the government was cutting off travel from people they didn't agree with. So you better go, and you better get your photographs to help you as a designer. So we started taking photographs as a, a repository, as having a repertory of ideas and memories to help us design. And that's what many architects did when they went on the grand tour. They did watercolors. And then um, Le, uh, Le Corbusier didn't do watercolors. He made little sketches of details he liked, but he bought postcards. So, and people do, they buy postcards, and they take, now they take photographs. And that's one whole dimension of why you do photography. But that was to grow with us as we got into ideas about architecture that we wanted to illustrate and other reasons. And then, of course, um, in the middle of all that, um, Robert was killed. And I came back, and Dave Crane had me live with them for about eight weeks until I found my feet again. That was a very great kindness of a young professor to do for a student. And um, so uh, at, that, at that point, um, I went back to school, finished school, and started teaching, and put my head down and worked for five years, and um, taught myself my profession, basically. I taught myself how to teach and how to run. Like when I got to an office, I could run planning teams in the office, using the people there and using my teaching methods. So it was really my, my sorrow time was also my time of, of training. I wouldn't wish the reasons on any of you, but it was an interesting thing. And then um, my first faculty meeting, I made an impassioned plea. Can you believe that people wanted to tear down the furnace library? It's a, it's a furnace building, and the, um, the, it was on the master plan of the campus to be torn down. And I made an impassioned plea not to tear it down. And I was the only one, and I was fighting everyone. And then finally, they held a vote, and people voted with me on that. And then a young man came up to me, and he said, um, I want you to know I agree with everything you said, and my name's Robert Venturi. <laughs> and, and I said, if you felt that, then why didn't you say something? <laughs> so that's the first things I said to Bob. <laughs> and, um, and then, by the way, one, uh, one time Dave Crane said to me, um, you should marry Robert Venturi. I'm going to have the two of you for, for dinner one day. And he did. But we'd already started dating by the time he did that. And then he got um, an invitation to, the, to go to Yale and I to the West Coast. So let's show some slides now and continue with, this, with the slides. So um, that's me as... Can you still hear me if I turn this way? Um, 
there. That's me as a, um, that's me now, as, um, actually I'm older than that. And um, <laughs> I keep getting older than my photographs and I can't keep up. And I have scorn showing myself as younger than I am. Um, and it's in Las Vegas, and that is the remains of all the signs that we documented, sitting out in the desert and loved by local, young local art, architectural historians. They care for it. And it's the most moving site. It's awesome. It's like a cathedral. And when we were there, some Russian visitors had just been there. And they could pick out the, um, the stardust sign. And one of those historians said, how do you know that's the stardust sign? Because just little stars were sitting there. They said, because we read Learning from Las Vegas. <laughs> Next. Um, I, I can't show you lots from Africa, and so there's much to show you, but um, I loved this kind of thing. Look, look at that amazing wide landscape. Look at the buildings, the same material as the felt around. And then the kind of life groups that there are there. So many things to say about that. And then here is mud, the Mapoch tribe housing. It's got Arabic influence, you can see. And look at the hand painting there. And of course, what fascinates me, they've painted pictures of a, of, of a Western suburban house in there. One of them has even got the street num number on the house. So all those influences together are very fascinating. This is an amazing one. It's a country store owned by Indians. It has English ads, American ads. It's got the name of the Indian owner in Zulu. It's got bicycles from England and cl cl um, cloth from Manchester. And all, and all these things made for the African trade. There'd be beads there too. So th that's a very interesting side of Africa, apart from the picturesque side and the game reserve and the, 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 and the kind of um, tribal housing. And here is an interpretation of the city of Bulawayo in Zimbabwe in the 19, I think it's 30s or 40s, and the train station is down there. These look like Liebeskind's skyscrapers, but it's an African's interpretation of high-rise buildings. So again, lovely art made out of the combination. The clash of cultures, which was politically so terrible, was artistically, I think, very interesting. Next. And of course, that's the, the squatter housing outside Johannesburg, and I can learn so many things from this picture. Identity is I live near the big rock. Um, and these houses are made like Western houses, not the round houses, the rondavos of the kraals. Um, and analyzing that as an urbanist, is, you know, and seeing how these developments happen that way is also part of the story next. Um, now we're coming to what I did learn as an architect from regional science and urban economics and what I think is very basic, that people don't realize when they talk about learning from Las Vegas. Um, when you talk about learning from Las Vegas, scornful people would say, um, you learned to put neon on the cathedral. And you, knew, you learned to put signs everywhere. And we did learn about communication as a function of architecture and gave it a place as a legitimate piece of architecture. But we were also very interested in the idea that there is pattern in activities and that that should also be part of our functionalism. And the patterns we were analyzing in Las Vegas were, of course, the new patterns of the automobile city of the American West. And um, so here is a beach. You can tell us the beach, but I would say to you, look how each of these groups is so evenly spaced. That's a bit of a bigger space, but otherwise they're pretty even around here. As if there's, if you, if you added 25 more people, the evenness would remain, but the spacing would get closer. It's like they're um, repulsion and magnets pushing away as far as they can from the others around. There's their own little cluster as far away 
So that's a pattern of behavior that people take up, not because someone told them to, but for many reasons. And then look where the, the shadows are, back this way. And so what is it here that makes the shadows? Well, obviously, the sun is shining like this. And they're, they're trying to get the sun. And then the other thing is they're all facing the, the, the ocean. So all of those determinants make that pattern. And that's something that interests me enormously in urbanism, but I take it right into the design, say, of a lab building, let alone the design of cities and campuses. Next. Um, so one person can bring a crowd of a million. But usually the great movements of people are to do with daily life, particularly the journey to work, for example. Next. Um, oh, one, just to diverge a little bit, it's not diverging really. I like to show this slide and I say, we architects have been criticized and rightly by sociologists saying, you design spaces that no one uses. Um, and they also say, why don't you go to the spaces that people like and try to find out why they go there and they don't go to your spaces? And therefore, go to Las Vegas and go to Los Angeles and try to see why that's so, so much more exciting to people than what you do. But I say, here are spaces that I have designed and they're full of people. <laughs> but there's a very special reason why they're full of people and it's got to do with those patterns of people on the beach. So let's look at some more patterns next. Um, the journey to work, you can see here, people um, who live in the outskirts and they all come into this half round city. Anyone know why it's half round and not full round? Because it's Chicago. <laughs> um, so if any other city, the, the circle would be made like that. And so this, this was um, a subject of much study. Of course, this is in the 1950s, so you can see the lines of the rails and settlement around the rails. And this is um, gradation, gradation, sociologists call it. They're talking about car ownership and low car ownership at the center and high car ownership. So the color gets darker as you get higher, but of course it gets sparser because it's further away. Usually the intensities that they measure are all greatest at the center and least. This is a reverse one. But those kinds of patterns are, are what I talk about. And the, the thinking like this originated in Germany in the 19th century and um, on farms and and places where they, they looked to see where crops were grown in relation to markets. And here you see these concentric circles of that sort. Uh, but basically it comes down to this. There's a root, and the root bring, brings people, and there's another root. And where the, these highly traveled routes cross, you get crossroads. And where you get crossroads, you get marketplaces, cathedrals, and eventually cities. So this is a crossroads view of, um, of the development of form. And um, I, I, I make this sort of mark, and I gave this lecture to some very young people in Mexico City a little while ago. At the end of the lecture, I saw students and faculty all going like this. <laughs> well, it's very easy. Now, these things get very highly computerized in the great transportation studies, for example. But the notion of it is so simple. This is where everyone wants to be. This is where the rents are highest. This is where the buildings will be highest. So we urban designers come along and we say, wouldn't it be pretty if we put all the high-rise buildings on top of hills? And then you know, planners sort of um, sigh because basically the high-rise buildings will want to go where most people will want to use them. So understanding this dynamic doesn't mean you have to always follow it, like why is there Central Park? It goes against everything. 
Well, people made a huge and concerted effort and got Central Park, and then all the buildings, they nudge each other to get on the park. Look at them, they really huddle together and they push at each other. And you really see that density and that excitement there, but there's only one in New York. You can't do that too often. You can make water run uphill, but you have to be a very, very good engineer. Most of the time, it's better to go with the flow, to go with the forces, if you can. So I evolved the notion of form follows not only function, but also forces. You can hear an architect say, it was economic forces built my building, not me. And so understanding that, and of course it, form, it follows topography, the forces of nature, it follows many other things, but this crossroads one is really important. And, and then this is the journey to work, it's another pattern. People go into work in the morning, and then there's not so much travel in the middle. It looks like a tooth in section, not so much travel. And then it, they come back at night. More come back than go in, because these people are added to those. And it also looks beautiful. And look how beautiful Clay's paintings are, which seem to, these are sign curves, I'm sure, but it's an invitation to a party at the Bauhaus. So this is saying, this mathematics can be an inspiration. It can be your muse. It doesn't stop you from being a really creative architect. It's just one of the tools you use. And it's a simple tool. Of course, there's many other tools. You know, reference, decoration, all sorts of things you may or may not like can go into the mix. But I think this is a very important one. And there's that beach again. And then here's all the other kinds of mapping that can be done. That's Noli's map of Rome that's been very basic to us. Again, it represents um, uses of people. This is public space, the white. And the gray is private space. And the cross hatching is churches. But you could take it as being civic buildings. And that can represent a public structure of a city. So public and private can be categories of functionalism in that sense, and ways of analyzing um, your, your work, uh, analyzing your own buildings, and also analyzing how you're going to put buildings into cities. Next. There's Philadelphia, which is now a, a whole city, not a half a city. And these are, and this is in the 1950s, so these are the important train lines out. Now when the suburbs came, they filled in there. And here's a study we did of Lancaster County, which looks more like the Cristalla patterns that were investigated in, I think, in Bavaria in the, th the 30s in Germany um, than, than any I know. It's a kind of agricultural area where the marketplace is half a day's journey by wagon and a full day's journey by wagon. And the towns grow up along the routes in that way very wonderful crutch for design. It can help you be functional. It can help you be sure that there are people in your spaces. And at the same time, it doesn't constrict you. It would be like saying, in a house, we know we, know we have to relate the bedrooms and the bathrooms in a certain way, but we don't think that constricts our creativity. But it is important to do it. Next. Uh, this was a picture, again, I was now taking photographs, not just of records, but of ways in which cities follow those rules. And there was snow over the whole of America when I went once from Philadelphia to San Francisco. And I just photographed, you can see the section lines in there, but the gray patches are towns. So the, 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 you can have great fun poring over aerial photographs and maps and seeing this, um, what was described by one transportation engineer as um, um, land use and transportation being inextricably intertwingled. Well, that's the intertwingling, and you can see how the densities grow. Next. Um, and so here is an aerial photograph of Las Vegas. That is the strip there, and these entomological looking things here are the casinos. And there's the city, the railroad city with a station here and Fremont Street down here. And we just put it next to Noli's map of Rome, just for amusement and aesthetics and for learning from. Next. 
And um, I love to show this one as an example of form follows forces, because people say, oh, it doesn't. That's not true. This is a part of KwaZulu. And here you see, you know, Boston is the cow town, but this is really cow town. These are cow paths down to um, a dry riverbed. So soil erosion you see here, clusterings of families, you know, the little clan groups of the tribal units there. And there's, you can't see roads because this is a subsistence society. There's no barter here. In fact, it's not altogether true because the men go to work in the cities. The women and the grandchildren um, scratch it out of the, of the, on the soil here and wait for payments from the men. But for all that, compare that with an advanced capitalist trading society which is held up by its transportation routes. These are the transportation system of Philadelphia. So if that doesn't prove that forces are part of the story, I don't know what would. Next. And then we grew to love looking at maps like this. Um, the standard land use colors, which are um, red for commercial, orange for intense housing, or else a mixture of residential and commercial, and residential is yellow. This is meant to be green, it got distorted. That's the parks. And um, here we've, we've, we did a project on South Street in Philadelphia, and this is ground floor uses only. Purple is industrial. And um, my professor of, of, of urban economics used to say, just think if you put all the land uses, the three or four floors that was in most of this area here, if you put all of those on this map, this thing would look like a bruise. Well, that bruise pattern we try to take apart here and to show the mixtures of use on all of these blocks. And we were trying to stop this, ex this whole area of South Street, which is down here somewhere, from being demolished for an expressway. And we, why did we do that? Because this was the, one of the greatest poverty areas in Philadelphia, and there was no public housing for people here to go to. So we were fighting to save this street so that the people here could continue to live here. And so we took it apart block by block to try to show the complexity that was there in this plan. But I love looking at these mixtures in here and trying to learn from them. Next. Um, now, every moment I had spare when I was um, at Penn, I would go out and photograph. And um, I start out as an industrial romanticist, learning from modernism. And then, you know, it happened in, at the AA, the, all of we who were out there photographing the bridge over the Firth of Forth, which is a marvelous um, 19th century, 18th century bridge. And, um, and I think it's late 18th century, not early 19th century. And, and then also, um, other industrial buildings, we began seeing that there were interesting steel and glass things in the, in the, on High Street in England, which is Main Street here, on, in the shops, in the stores. And so we began photographing those and then began photographing signs. So I was photographing signs and, and commercial architecture before ever I came to America. But here I'm being a, an industrial romantic. But if you look very hard down here, you can see the PSFS building in City Hall, which is the old silhouette of Philadelphia of the 1950s and early 60s. And now there's a whole set of skyscrapers in there. Next. And um, this, is a, this is a lovely thing I took to show scale relationships between the kind of Greek architecture of the waterworks in Philadelphia and the Roman architecture um, of, the, of the museum. And, and Bob and I love these scale jumps and um, how, what they mean in the city and how they can be used in civic architecture. And I'm just showing a group of people in a lecture on space that this is the Roman pattern that that one is built on. Next. So this is um, photography to express ideas, which is the next step. Um, and I, again, I'm having fun, these buildings all have the same scale, but that one is a very small building, but it's got the same scale as the very big ones. And this is an old furnace building that they demolished for the addition to City Hall. How stupid. 
And they kept saying, it isn't a very good furnace building. We can demolish it. Um, they didn't look at it to see what a wonderful building it was. Next. And there's me being industrial romantic, looking at these warehouses on the edge of Philadelphia. Next. And again, um, just evolving the, the, the philosophy which says, um, if you argue with yourself about, should I take this, shouldn't I take it, I've got so many slides, should I take it? You'll find that by the time you work out why you wanted it, it's gone. So I say, don't think, just shoot. Next. And more warehouses. Next. Um, that's, again, like this commercial environment in the, um, uh, on 40th Street. We did a studio on 40th Street, and I went out photographing to show the students what was there. Um, so long before we did um, the strip, we were doing this kind of study. Next. Um, and then in West Philadelphia, this row house, the typologies, the thematic units of the city. So Philadelphia was the biggest heavy industry center in the world um, until about 1914. And working class people could afford to own their own houses. So there's just these great stretches of row house Philadelphia. And, and they're kind of wonderful. Next. And um, this is a street, I think it's Uber Street or Alter Street. And I did a study with a group of women there about, they were having successes about social renewal in these streets when the planners weren't at all. And they were such, they were the old gentlewomen growing flower pots with low income matriarchy members. And they got on so well together. And when they grew flower pots, behavior changed. And um, so I was there photographing with them. And next. And I also, I read um, work by Cartier-Bresson. I used to read quite a lot about photography. And he talked about being in a place where he waited and waited because something had to come across the photograph. And I found this. And I waited and waited. And these two little girls made the, completed the arc. They were perfect. It's one of my favorite photographs. Next. And again, industrial romanticism then with um, the car strips coming in. Next. And that's New York. It's, you know, that's cubism with all these wonderful shapes. Um, I was very influenced. You know, all the times that we spent wandering through museums in Europe, Robert, Scott Brown, and I, and looking at the, the, the origin of modern painting and loving that, and I still do. So my eye was into that, and I was thinking of things like Braque, next. And that's Feininger. Um, it's, I was in a hotel in New York, and I think you can see there's a stream of light comes through one of these corner windows. So I'm not a, my photography is not um, technically, I have a good camera, very, an Alpa camera. Robert and I bought two Alpas and three lenses. Um, but it's really my eye, and my eye is to do with architecture, but it's more than architecture, and it begins to go to the things I'm interested in. And then I take something, and then I later find out why I took it, and that helps my interests to grow. Next. And then there was this young man around the place who came and talked to me in the furnace, about the furnace building. And um, as we left, um, he, du during, I started teaching and we started dating in 1960. And I would have him come and um, give my students crits, my urban design students, in the evening. So he was picking up from me a lot of the social revolt that was going on, which the architects were blithely ignoring at that point. But Bob's mother was a socialist and a pacifist. He was literally the only one who understood why I was interested in Herbert Ganz's work and who understood that this was a jolt to my system and to architecture system, but one that we needed. It broke open our systems and it was good, not bad. So that's why I had to invite him to come and see Las Vegas with me when I 
got there. But at that point, we had been teaching together. We, there was a theories course, and I taught the first semester, which was bringing together the, the lectures of various other people and giving some myself. And then his, so that was about uh, landscape, architecture, and city planning. And then Bob's was about architecture the next semester. And he set up the first theories course in, the, in America, as far as I can make out. And he did it because Holmes Perkins asked him to. No one knows the reason. I think I know the reason because Paul Davidoff in planning, um, uh, you know, at bay in there saying, the trouble is no one has any theory. And the year before he gave a course in theory of planning. And I used to go and kibitz at that course. I'd say, Paul, you haven't done any planning. You're a social scientist. You don't ever draw. I know more about it than you do. And yes, you're right, but you're not all that right. This happens. And later he admitted to me how difficult it was to have a, a very verbal young fellow professor criticizing him as he was forming a course. He was very great hearted. But I think Holmes Perkins saw the success of that course, therefore introduced theory, and, and the rest is history about theory and architecture. So Bob and I were working, and it came to a point where I ran the seminar classes for his theory course as well as mine, and set up the exams and the reading lists for both courses. And the idea was, the theory course would help the designers know better what to do in studio, but you had to have a seminar to help make the connection. So I got used to making the connection between theory and the design project and finding the structuring the theory lectures to go along with the kind of buildings they were doing. And when we stopped that whole thing, apparently performance in studio went way down. But so that, that Bob and I at this point were, were colleagues at a point when the people in the petition said he didn't even know me. It means they didn't read Complexity and Contradiction because in the preface it says, thank you to, to Denise Scott Brown for all her help. And they say, oh, well, she, she had nothing to do with Complexity and Contradiction. Next. And there was me. I was taking photographs and also running my studios. Um, I think that's when I got to California. And I thought particularly in this photograph of... The, you know, the glass, the view of glass in modern architecture of the 30s and the way Mies designed glass buildings and the book by Arthur Korn called Glass in Buildings. So it's a, it's a comment on modern architecture as well as a picture of me taking a picture. Next. And now here I get to Los Angeles. And we're setting up a school, we're planning a school, and I'm, amongst other things, producing... Um, this, uh, stuff for a slide library. So whenever I get the chance, I go out photographing. Um, and I came via six cities. I haven't shown you that. And very soon I got, I took myself to Las Vegas. But let's just go on next. Um, these pictures along, when I was teaching at UCLA, which I moved from Berkeley to UCLA, in Berkeley during the free speech movement, one more social revolution and then to UCLA. And we, I put all my students in a, a, a Los Angeles transportation company provided bus and driver, and we drove the expressways all day. And the funny thing was that I, we'd, we'd all listen to the clicks of the photographs, and all those architects would click in certain places, and I would click in other places. And um, in the article I wrote on active socioplastics, I, I evolved that into a description of the difference. And I said, put a group of architects, urban designers, and planners in a bus, and the architects will click houses and bridges and civic buildings. The urban designers will click where houses and bridges and civic, design and civic buildings meet. And the planners will be too busy talking to look out of the window. <laughs> Next. So this is me having a romance with the Los Angeles landscape. Next. Next. Um, and then um, amazing subsets. This is the very sandy bluffs along the Pacific Highway. And these funny little things creeping out, peeping out. And they're steel trailer houses. So you get sand and steel, and these things almost like they could fall over. 
So a, a piece of urbanism that I found just fascinating, things like that, next. And there, it's, you see more of, it you know, gets to, to the land, there's that bluff behind you, next. I have, I think, 10,000 slides or so, next. <laughs> next. Next, that's one of my favorites. Next, that too. Next, and then more industrial romanticism. Next, and then I go to Las Vegas and I can't believe what I see there and I talk about having this shiver, frisson, the French word's much nicer to describe it. And it says, do you hate it or do you love it? And the answer was, don't think, just shoot. <laughs> but I thought of Greece. Look at that pure, pure blue sky and the bright, bright colors. And I thought of the fact that the pentelic marble on the Acropolis had been painted. And I thought, if they did that, it would look like that. Next. And that used to be a marvelous picture, as bright as the other, it's faded. But this is the, 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 I call it the minor architecture. There's a book called Architettura Minore di Venezia, all the little buildings of Venice. Well, this is the minor architecture of the strip, not the big casinos. Next. 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 And I, I got in buses, and that took me a little bit higher. And one day, I was caught on a bus in the early morning, and the bus broke down, and all the people going to work on the strip, and they all set on me, the only tourist. They said, you think we have one-armed bandits in the nursery schools, don't you? So they didn't like the view of that Las Vegas is only made of this. Next. And again, there's, there is the strip. And this is what we analyzed and photographed and you can see it's in the desert at that point. Next. All of this is gone. Um, Steve Wynn tore down most of the neon to make Las Vegas have a wider meaning than just gambling. He was probably right from the economic point of view. Um, I, it's lovely when the, when the space breaks down, but I'm really more interested in it in a day. Next. Next. And this kind of silhouette view I love too. Next. And look at this, as Bob called it, Jambolonia with, a, with um, an anatomical exaggerations. And then look at this pediment. When we first got there, this Caesar's Palace was that size. Then they needed a bigger billboard, so they added one column outside of the pediment on either side. And then Bob said, never in the history of, uh, of antiquity or the Renaissance was this solution ever thought of. <laughs> Next. 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 So I went about four times I love this. You see, these are scale givers in architectural terms. Here are the people, and here are the centurions. And the relationship, this makes the whole thing human for them. And we use that as a technique in lots of our architecture. Next. And then here's the architectura minore again. The, you know, the, the, the standard signs that you see everywhere, but much taller here. Next. Next. And that's the time I like it best at dusk. So you begin to get the sunset and the signs. Next. Next. And this is Fremont Street. Glorious too, but not as exciting from the point of view of understanding urbanism. Next. Next. And um, that is people using it. Next. Now, where are we? Um, we're still looking at Las, Las, or rather Las Vegas, but I want you to know that in parallel with this study, we were working on South Street. And by the way, Bob's 
Dad's fruit and produce store was on South Street. That's why Alice Lipscomb, the matriarch who, who presided over this whole area and saved her people in many ways, um, that's why she would work with us, because we were also Venturi Incorporated Fruit and Produce. And Bob and I did run that business and the other one. So Bob's a long-haired egghead who's also a fruit and produce merchant. <laughs> so much for the people who say he's a, a brittle person. Next. And we were out in the desert, and we had such a wonderful time. We had rock and roll music. And so we celebrated it. So Bob took that picture, and I told the woman in design who asked me, why did I do that? I said, I was hamming. <laughs> I said, I've, I've learned that if you want to be a teacher, you have to ham. If you love something, there's no use saying, I love something. You have to say, I adore it. <laughs> well, that was hamming. And now, me, I'm thinking of Magritte, and I'm thinking of scale plays. So that's a chimney of a house that burned. And then here's a 22-story building, the sign almost the size of the building. And there's Bob. Where, why he was wearing a black suit, God only knows. <laughs> but there it is. So mine's a very stylized kind of art piece, and Bob's a record shot. <laughs> and then I'm the one who again arranges them so that they you know, they're above each other like that. I like the fact that this organization sticks out like that. Next. And there we were. In, see, it was all desert behind there, and there's our car. Next. And look at the centurion looking at his legions, but the legions <laughs> are parked cars. And this is the one picture that Bob asked me to take. Bob doesn't take photographs, but every now and then he says, please get this photograph, and I want this sign digging this Venus. It's an Avis with a Venus, and <laughs> digging her in, the el in its elbow into her waist. <laughs> Next. And then this tells you that it's signs in space, symbols in space before form in space. The space is defined by instances by points, not by walls, as in a medieval city or a, you know, a Victorian city. Um, and I love this, understanding the city that way, and from a car window, you can see. Next. And then we go into the study, and we make our own Noli map um, of the strip, using this as the basis. Next. And so here are our mapping studies, learning from the ones I showed you, the economic ones, but learning more, in this case, from Noli. And so these are building coverage, and small buildings and pathways. And then here are the interiors. And here you see them again. It's like this is the civic space within each one. It's made up of the, of the casino and various other things. And then here is the... Um, the, the parking around it. And that makes a kind of a Noli map. You can't read them too well here. But it's trying to understand this in different ways. Next. And um, we, we thought of many ways of mapping, because when you use orthograph, ortho, orthogonal projection, the, um, the signs show as just a little line on the map, and yet they're so strong. So we're looking for other ways of showing the uses of the signs and where they cover. And that begins to give you the feeling of the strip, which you can get from these pictures up here. And this puts every word that we had on any sign on the strip in its place on a portion of the strip. I'm still looking for someone to do a doctoral dissertation on the words in signs. Next. <laughs> and now here's a, a land use map of Las Vegas. And you can see that the, the, this is the, um, the famous strip. This is the, the downtown. And then here's some other commercial strips. And then all of the yellow is residential. So remember this, because we're going to what planners call disaggregate it. Next. And um, here you see, I can't see these ones, so someone's going to have to read what it says here. Can you see it? One of them is churches, and one of them is supermarkets. Yes. And that means 
this is a pattern you would have found in New Haven where we were working, very similar. But this one here is um, wedding chapels. And this one here is car rental. And those patterns of how uses associate themselves, very interesting and fun. And again, it makes you think about where other ways of planning buildings too, understanding those relationships. By the way, we have a puppy, and I call him our crossroads dog, because he sees where I am, and he knows I could go in two directions, and exactly at the meeting where I'll make a decision, that's where he lies. <laughs> Next. And here we took those standard land use colors that you see here, you've seen this map before, and we put them into the casinos. So we made the red of, of the, um, of the, of the gambling place, the commercial. And the blue was the co conference center. The green was the patio. Of course, yellow was the rooms. And these are enormously different in looks. But when you do this, you begin to see certain relationships are very constant. When you walk in, you walk right into the gambling. And then you go through to get to the, um, to the patio and the, and the housing, for example. Um, you don't see the registration desk in what, these hotels. You see the gambling, and the registration desk is somewhere here to your side. Um, so it's a, a, another interesting way to analyze the complexity of something to find its, its um, systems next. And then I'll go quickly through these. These are in the book. Ways of uh, relating space and scale as we did for the Las Vegas study next. You've seen these before, next. Um, this is fun because you see, learning from this, we designed this at the Perelman Quad at Penn. And we've just also our entrances to our museums have little columns where the, where the, um, the Roman centurions and, and gladiators are here. Next. And the students did this, which we like no end. Next. Um, and coming to Levitan, and here we become um, uh, social and cultural anthropologists, and we look into this architecture as a function of values of the people living here, and class values and taste values, and many other things too. The references that they, um, you know, they all refer to historical architecture, but we also did what we called content analysis. It was called remedial housing for architects, which meant we architects have learned to do navel gazing, which as we call housing. We say, what did Le Corbusier do? Or what did Zaha do? And we don't say, what do merchant builders do and why? And what should we do for our populations now? And sometimes very ridiculous mistakes are made. Um, but we said, look at what some other people feel about housing. So we did analysis of various journals and New Yorker magazine cartoons and Mickey Mouse strips and movies. And um, particularly, we analyzed the backgrounds of ads on TV. What kind of housing background you need to sell pickles? And so that was a large portion of the study. Next. And this has never been published. Um, so this was looking at all the different decorations on the same Levitan houses, how people could alter them to make them theirs next. And this is looking at, um, it's complex. You need to read the titles here. But different class groups and the tastes they have and how it affects their housing environments. And if you look, um, the ones that are lowest income people are mainly shown in gray because the pictures we had to get for them came out of um, fundraising, or rather um, uh, 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 letters asking for donations and things like that. Whereas for the richer people, it could be from magazines and, and different sources. Next. So this, this student said she had to read 44 books on sociology to do this. So they were a set of matrices trying to an analyze housing values and how they affected housing form. Next. And then, again, this is more content analysis. Um, this is of, of the bungalow. 
and I can't remember what this one was. But uh, again, these are all ways of using photography and our um, the, the kind of social sciences knowledge, but to try to find a way. No sociologist could do this. This is real primary research and addition to the field. I said, we did for Herb Gans what he couldn't do in the Levitanus, which is the formal side of it. And we, it means that students who are very socially concerned could feel they were really adding. And um, it would be nice to get this material out still next. Um, and again, if you want to sell a house, look how the, the, the silhouette of the roof is very important and the advertising family life. Next. Next. Um, and we did mock-ups of um, three different types of house. It is an ethnic one in the inner in city, an Italian house. Um, I think that, no, that, which is which? I think this is the Italian house. And then this is an ex-urban house. And they tell you what the origins are of all the references. Next. And um, this is themes and ideals of the American suburb. It had two more panels. And it, with so many components of the themes there, so we just tried to analyze them all and put them all together. And this was in the, this was the show Signs of Life, Symbols in the City. And um, it was at a time when postmodernism, um, our form of postmodernism, which came out of very serious social thought. And I said, look, it's partly a, a social tract. And my colleague said, you've got to be kidding. Your generation said, you don't have to tell us that. But it was very hard to get people to believe that. And then it got worse, because um, most people were meant to just read the headlines and then go to the part that interested them and read a little, very small writing, only where it interested them. But Philip Johnson, in the city room of this show, read the whole thing. And out of that came his postmodernism for commercial architecture. Um, so I'm not so sure that that was a very good use of what we were doing, because ours, you know, <laughs> origins of a lot of our thought came out of things like Holocaust studies, which said, after the Holocaust, there can be no innocence in architecture. Ville Radio's is innocence. It thinks of a brave new world, and it forgets that an early use of industry was in frying people in ovens. Next. And, but that is the city room. And that faucet we found in a plumber store in Flower Town outside of Philadelphia. And we borrowed it and we repainted it. And people used to say, I'll meet you at the faucet um, when the show was up. And on the plumber store, it's had a big sign saying, gone to the Smithsonian. <laughs> Next. And now, um, let me see where we are in this lecture. Um, this has brought us, Bob and I are already married, and we are back in the East Coast working on the West Coast. And we're talking now also about the use of photography there for research, for advocacy, the use of the photo essay, learning from Las Vegas, the book is a big photo essay, you could say. And um, sort of summarizing in an interim way, um, I for some reason lost my, um, my counter there. Um, I claim that I am a circus horse rider between all my fields. I'm asking people to think of architecture as a generous window opening on a very wide view and to consider widening the view. And then, because nothing is wholly true if it doesn't have its opposite, there are times when you must narrow the view. Zaha Hadid said, for an architect, context is a white page. I say, Zaha, at least think of it as a yellow page, because white pages scare architects. Um, but in actual fact, sometimes you do all this reading and all this studying and all this looking, and then you close the book. And you get a good night, and you start with a white page. And then unconsciously, all the stuff comes back in. So it's both things, but you're not only a white page, and not everything should start from scratch. Um, 
Then um, I mix architecture and planning. I mix disciplines. I mix research and design. These studios went research, design, research, design. That was my argument with Paul. He said, you do research, then you do design. I said, no, Paul, you do subroutines all the time, all the way through. And um, the studios were set up that the students worked in a team, but they each had a topic. And they shared their topic in different phases with each other so that they could get information on the whole project from each other. And then they went on with a related part of their topic. So it was always research, share, research, research share, maybe design at a certain point, but design used as a tool for research at that time, a heuristic for research. Then later, research is a heuristic for design. And that, I think, the people who've imitated our studios have missed all that side of it. But that's a part of this. Analysis and synthesis are intertwined all the way through. The team and the individual, um, there would have been no LLV without planning school. And photography becomes a discipline of architecture. And as you go into the future, this kind of summarized that, but it was pre-computer. Then the computer, I used to do computer wannabe drawings. All those um, ones about the journey to work I showed you, I call those computer wannabe drawings because it was pre-computer, but they, oh, they wished they had one. The same way as <laughs> Frank Lloyd Wright wished he was design, building in stone when he built in stucco that looked like stone. It's a similar thing. So then suddenly we could do colored drawings in reports and we could use photographs, but we could also use maps and we could combine all of that, and that changes the whole story. Now we can go on and talk about work. And um, this little house, which people say I had nothing to do with, and I can tell you that if you look at the models in, the in, the, in MoMA, there's six models, and five of them, Bob, is a Khan groupie. And then there's a kind of a pause, and the sixth comes out, and it's a whole different thing. And Bob is himself. And everything we've ever done since is in embryo in this building. And that goes for the fact that all this thing about the intertwining of movement and use is in this building. But why? He's been going to my studios, and he's been listening to all the things about you know, the big um, Chandigarh studio where um, Lou Kahn came and criticized, and all the architects came, and Bob came, and they heard about how transportation and, and land use must be intertwined at all levels. And suddenly, you'll find it intertwined in this house. And then to my amazement, I discovered this um, architect. He was a, an Austrian Jewish refugee called Joseph Frank. And he, he died in about 1960-something. And he had to flee from Austria to, Swiss, to Sweden when the Nazis came. And then he had to flee to the New School of Social Research. And he was a very caustic, witty person. And he was a wonderful architect. His, his, uh, it's a beer house. It's called his marvelous in Vienna. But he almost did no architecture after that. And he went to um, work for the equivalent of Knoll in Sweden. And he invented Swedish modern furniture, Austrian Jew. And therefore, he's arguably more influential than Le Corbusier, because out of that came IKEA. <laughs> so if you put it all together, you may not like it. I'm very bored by IKEA. I think Joseph Frank was wonderful. But his criticisms of modernism are even more wonderful. And he's the one who says the road goes through the building, and the road goes up the streets. And the most public places come where, the, where you enter and where most people pass, and then the bedrooms are quieter. And if you look at the plan of this house, you'll see that there. None of us had heard of Joseph Frank, but he really sits in the middle. So I wrote an article for his collected writings in English, which are fun to read. They're really funny. He talks about um, the fact that you must be true to the machine. And he says, so, OK, we're doing a shoe with a machine. And the machine works best vertically and horizontally. So we'll make a rectangular shoe in section. And, and, and then it, you make it the left one and the right one the same, because that'll do better for mass production. 
And then where it doesn't quite fit every foot, you can always put some padding. And then after you've made the shoe, the machine can gratefully take a rest. <laughs> and so you know, I, I think modernism overdid it about the truth to machinery, and he caught that overdoing. But he also caught on to many things that later, maybe we got them from Alto. And I have a feeling that Alto may have learned from Frank. Um, but go, going on next. Next slide. This is hard to see, but I gave a lecture called Encounters with the Palimpsest. And the Palimpsest is a document made in parchment that was cleaned off because they were expensive and other documents put on. And you can work your way through all of them if you're a researcher. Well, here is um, a design drawing, uh, probably a working drawing of Bob's mother's house and Bob's drawn over it where the furniture is going. So it's a kind of a simple palimpsest. And um, also you can see the, um, if I can get it carefully here, where the, um, no, I'm not picking it up properly, where the, the entrance is here and where you come in here and the kitchen is here and the part that is tiled, which is marble, is the public sector. And it goes up the street here. It takes a funny curve like that, learning from Lutchens, if you're interested, and to a public area, and then a public area but less public, and then to the private part. And then also, Frank says, um, the, the attics of modern houses are more interesting than the houses themselves. And he just defines attics as having unusual shapes and light coming from different places and columns where you don't expect them. In those terms, Bob's mother's house is all attic. <laughs> and also, um, you know, we know it, it narrows in plan in this direction, but it also is squashed. Um, it, lo it loses the middle floor. So when you enter in the front door, you're faced by the attic stairs. And all the romance of of attic staircases that children talk about is right there. And it's also, though, a Baroque, a Baroque altar with light coming from unusual places when you look at it from the outside. So it's a very complex statement that had many ways to grow. Next. Um, and here I want to go very quickly. It's our National Gallery building. Um, these are ones I have been very much involved with next and other parts of the National Gallery building. You see, we do an early map for almost everything we do, and we analyze how it tied to Trafalgar Square and Leicester Square. And this is a billboard. And there's a modern building creeping behind it all the way around. Next. This much, I gave a two-hour lecture on that building alone once. Um, and um, here is our building in Toulouse, which is like a state capital. And, um, the French architects hate this reference to their historical architecture. But when I explained to them about linking two commercial areas with a shortcut and then putting the buildings along them and then having access from the sides to portions of them, they said, this begins to make sense. We see why you did those things. So in fact, the decoration on the outside puts them off. But when they understand it, it you know, they like it. When they did what, they made an addition there, and not one of them had any idea of how to deal with a crowd in the building. And I think of a crowd as, it's made like a, a ball of cotton, and it, it makes bulges, and it twists, and it makes, um, it, it goes into long worm shapes as people distribute themselves, and it's pretzel shaped where you enter. You all gather on the outside, you go through the door, and you gather in the same crowd on the inside. So I do a lot of crowd design in those buildings. And this, this one and the National Gallery, certainly it's the crowd design and the shapes of those public spaces. Next. And here you see it. This is the way we like to photograph it. We waited a long time for that red car. <laughs> and you see, it's sort of cut off the way you'd see a temple in a romantic landscape. And of course, we have other, other places where, like other architects, we want everything the hell out of our picture. It's two different purposes. Next. And there we show you a sort of a transition for, from a human being, 
via this column to this scale, and lots of different scales in this building. And it goes right the way through here, and people do use it for a shortcut, which is what we wanted. Next. And this is a way to show what the character of the inside is by collage. Um, we went with the photographer there, and we told them the pictures we wanted. And you know, when you get back to the office, you say, my God, why did we take only all the public spaces and we forgot the classrooms? Now we want to show a client we can do classrooms, and we forgot to do that. So we try to think of all that. But also, I like to show pieces of that, what I call the order of architecture. And our photographer who's worked with us for years, he said, why did you want that? But it sort of makes the building. Next. And this is um, national scale. It's their rainbow logo made very large, and it suggests a very large circle and suggests the fact that this is a regional building. Next. And I love these views. I love the graffiti here and the, the small scale view. We didn't want to overwhelm this small-scale environment, so we made the building in two pieces, and we did a lot of things to show it was made of small and large scale. Next. And we made this crossing without ever having seen the site the way it was. It had been cleared by the time we got there. And I say, we, most architects, they meet a big cleared site, and they become interior decorators. We'll put an armchair in this corner, an armchair in this corner, the rug in the middle, slab building here, another slab here, room for two more slabs, here's the open space. And I say, we say, this is China, and here goes the Silk Road. And here are the great crossroads to other cities. And at the crossroads, we'll put our centers of activity. And that's what we did with this. And then when we found eventually an ancient plan, we found exactly where we had put our diagonal, there had been one. That's our palimpsest. And oh, how I love the fact that we reproduced what was logical in the first place. Next. And um, now, where are we here? This is, um, this is Tsinghua. And I can't tell you all about it. No, no, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing this well. Yes, I think it is, I'm right. It was a, a study we did for them when they were doing a, a re, an updating of their master plan. And I can't go into it all, but we did a great deal of mapping. Look at this wonderful, that's the delivery system on this campus. They do have trucks in the early morning, but all day they have that. I say, one day I'll see them moving a house with two bicycles. <laughs> Next. Tsinghua was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience working there. And the, the kids, the students were so bright. Um, and all the different kinds of mapping we did to arrive at a design. The design is here, but we analyzed it in all these different ways. The skill of working out which variables to study and which to overlap is very important. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and, you know, if you're analyzing Memphis, you have to include the jazz clubs. And of course, not only there's many, the cotton factors and there's many other things. But um, here, we had to find out in a strange culture what it is we really had to analyze. Next. And um, this very beautiful landscape down here, which has been an American prep school, believe it or not, 1911, to send Chinese students to America. And we extended that landscape all the way through based on what we analyze, and that's what it looks like. So much I could tell you, but there's no time. Next. Um, and now, this is Michigan, and um, it's a 3,000-acre campus. And we were asked to um, be the campus planners. Um, and so here you see the original um, square which is here in the, in the plan, which was given to them. It had been a commons. And you see three houses here, and those houses are still there. And here it is, was as it began as one block, and now it's 3,000 acres stalking across the region. And so we began, obviously, with a mapping study, and with a topography study. Water management was a very important variable on this campus. Next. And here you see it. Um, we, we always put 
the, the commercial when we analyze campuses. And the mer merchants are so grateful. Um, because if, I would be very scared of me if I were a merchant. I'm going to, you know, I, I, they hang on by the tips of their fingers and I'm the one going to change everything. So I try to show them we're really thinking of them. And it's just more like a European campus because town and Ghana are so close. And um, we, we did this large scale land use map and then also disaggregated it next. And um, there is the river floodplain. You can see it on a misty day from the sky, but here you see it and where all the water seeps to. And that must influence a great deal of what you do. And here is the land use map of a portion of it. This is the map which shows the commercial. You see there's no commercial here. This was a case of um, child abuse, I said, because after 5 p.m. there's just no way to get anything on this campus, not even a cup of coffee. And I said, not even a Sudafed. The result was they installed a Sudafed machine. <laughs> um, but this is a mixture of um, labs, um, classrooms, and um, auditoria, which show where the density levels are on the campus. And you can make this big, and you can see all the detail in there. But meanwhile, you can understand something about it this way, too. The architecture school was up here, which did not thrill the architects. They were rusticated a mile and a half, and great buses came through here. And um, this is the medical school. There's a there's a an interstate that goes here. And if you can look carefully there, you see a sort of an oval somewhere in there. And this was an old lake in here. They call it the cat hole. And um, I'm trying to see it around here. But that became very significant in the design. Next. Um, was that the next one, or was the other one? Um, OK, we can go here. Here is the, the area of, no, I can't see where this is, of the lake in there. And you can see where the buses come and bring people from different parts of the campus to a big, you could say, a, a, a transit stop here. And so all these buses here, and the people from the medical school trying to get to their work here, and they say their lives are in danger. So that was very important in the planning. And here's where we've mapped the sciences through the whole campus, top left. And this is the arts. And the arts formed a kind of an axis this way. The science is a great diagonal across everything, right across the town. And I began to say, um, here is a, an arts axis which goes through to the medical school. And somewhere in here is that lake in there. And somewhere down here, I better go and stand closer so I see more. Um, down here, I found a bridge that went to a fitness center. And, um, and the, the, the fitness center was very well connected by the bridge. And the bridge went straight. There was no hump in it. And I said, hmm. Here we have a lake, and its whole perimeter is at the same level. And we could put something that went from the sciences here, up here, and across the lake, and across the I-95, which the bridge is over, which goes here like that. And we could get the people from the medical school without even realizing it, without knowing they'd crossed a bridge to the medical school. And I said, you've got room for three big labs right here. And they said, why three labs? And I said, because every university I've worked for has recently built three labs. And the next day, the president announced three labs. <laughs> and so I said, this is a major point for you to have life sciences labs because of having the sciences here and the medical here. And there's the hospitals here and the medical school here. And um, and, and then here go the arts, and they go right through to the arts in the town as well. And a beautiful old Art Deco theater, the state, state theater over here, a movie house. 
So that and that connect. And here is my meeting of minds, my meeting place, my crossroads. And the idea is people, you can't say to scientists or others, now here's a place and you will meet. And you know that's the last place they'll meet. But you can bring your crossroads and you can put a sitting place and you can put a, a cafe and you can put a coffee lounge and they'll get started and they'll meet in an interdisciplinary way if they pass each other. And then where will the next Nobel Prize be gestated? At the lab bench or in the coffee shop? Next. And um, here I discovered that Olmsted and others before him, now after him, had said these areas are badly connected because of this road. And another study had done the same thing. They showed kind of ectoplasm growing across there, but they didn't know what it was. And here, it, here's the problem. Here are the sciences, and here's the route you want to take. This, they call it the refrigerator. It's 1980s hospital buildings. Everyone now thinks it's a huge constraint on their development. And then a, a big drop here of 40 feet. So what do we do about all of this in the context of all the other? We made many, many recommendations for this campus, but this is the one where we really influence it in a large way. Next. So I do my NOLI maps, and I've got all my points of entry to these buildings and the inside public space related to the outside public space. And here I put a set of desire lines. As you saw for Chicago, those lines that went from the center out. These are the places people want to go. And this is not, it's not brain surgery. That's brain surgery. This is not brain surgery. It's quite simple to see where they want to go. You don't have to do a whole computer study, though some social scientists will criticize me for doing this without the computer study. But um, I missed one. It was this one up here. So this was what we wanted to do. We wanted to cross this cat hole. We wanted to get people from one side to the other. Next. And that's, that's the synthesis of, of the, an, the analysis, which starts with just points in space. It overlaps points in space. It links them. And before you know it, you're getting into a design mode while you're analyzing. And um, so this is what I do here. I, by the way, I had an architect working for me in this wonderful, diverse office we had when we were big. And um, he had studied medicine for one year. And I've been very influenced by thinking not of transportation systems, but by digestive tracts and uh, nerve patterns and things like that. And not to, not to be a, a uh, you know, not, to, not to say I'm going to have a city with lungs in it, but how do those patterns form? So I was looking at this macrame pattern of the, every single pathway in that area in orange. Look at the tight, taut pattern it is. And I said, it's like nerve synapses, and we're going to grow this pattern. And so here we go. We're taking it up through the sciences. We're taking it through the arts. We're growing it across the road, and up this way. Now, we're going up this way and then across the road. That's a cafeteria building. That's a lab building. That's a lab teaching building. And then it links back here. This is a kind of a romantic landscape. This is a pretty formal one. And it goes through and past this playing field and on, on and up, and there's going to be more labs here. So that's basically, we follow the desire lines and we make a pattern that will take all of that. And here's my service access. I'm, I'm very passionate about keeping service access use, useful too, particularly when it's so snowy. They can park their snow plows in here at night before a, snow, a snowstorm and start in the morning early. And um, so I'm the one telling them about things like that. They don't think it's important, then they're very grateful they have it. Um, and so that's the basic pattern, and there's the meeting of minds. Next. Now, um, I'm thinking of synapses, and I'm thinking of a medieval road pattern. And I adore Venice, and we go to Venice, we've gone over and over to Venice. I call this my linkage salamander. It, blue is sciences, red is arts, yellow is residential. And this is the, the lab, here's the cafeteria, and it goes across that way. 
And so you can be a scientist and you walk by here and you meet a friend from these labs and you have a coffee here or maybe in this lab. Um, and, and then the, you see the pattern shown here, the street through the building, street through the building. Here's a meeting place between the vertical and the horizontal circulation. And here's the coffee lounge. And here are the lab benches looking like the grid of a city. These are the faculty offices over here. We put the faculty offices as they want them. Some people want them this way, some want them all this way, some want them separate. But then look at the pattern of roads in Venice, which widen and narrow and widen and narrow. And that's what we're learning from as well. Um, and then the red is cafeteria and, and shop. Um, underneath this is a um, bioinformation system where people can go for information from experts and using um, computers for biosciences. And they get talking with each other there. And uh, the idea is they learn that they're all using the same formulae, just using different um, letters of the alphabet. Um, next. And there you see it. Yeah, and there's, there's my meeting of the minds. And that's the picture I showed you there. They actually are meeting there. And there's also a, a rotunda, a, a little rostrum here. I wonder, I, I can't, have, don't have a good picture of it anywhere, but it's down, it's in here. And you can come out of the lab building and you can sit and eat a sandwich there. And there's a stairway down as well to this area. And I say, I'm not telling anyone, you could play a violin there and you get a crowd at lunchtime, but you can have Roman centurions marching up the stairway um, to a, a performance of Julius Caesar being acted on the rostrum and the people would sit around here. So there's many things. It's a jungle gym for grown-ups. It's a playpen. And the theory that you can't design public space and you can't design meeting space if people find it's convenient, they will meet there. And if they find an arena and they want to make a stage, they will use it. And when they do, it becomes public. People, through their activities, make it public. You just make a framework. Next. And um, the next thing is, this is really me at work. If Bob were doing it, it might be a little different, though he and I were agreed about this. And our model was Albert Kahn, the one that Mies learned from for his steel buildings. But he did these beautiful brick labs at Michigan. And then there's our order of architecture, which we arrive at from this order of architecture. He uses a giant order, and so do we. You see, there's two floors, but this set of things links them. It, you, you read four, four groups on two floors together. And we have... Um, this way through here, and we also, well, I'll show you some more later, but so that's the other side of it, deriving a vocabulary for this building from its history, but making it light and more modern. And then we're being modernists. That's the kind of thing the early moderns like to do and I love to do. And there's our coffee level, and it goes across to a bridge here, coffee shop level and, and meet on, meeting of minds level. Next. Um, and... Here you see it again. Um, and that's the lab building. I, I love this. It's very, it's parking structure under. And then this mostly glass wall here. I'm thinking of the Fanella factory. These are, they're very good models for basic ordinary buildings. And if they'd let us put signs, they don't even have the system of putting people's names on buildings because the government pays for everything. So you can't even put a name or anything on a building. And they didn't want expensive sculpture. I would have put a kind of a, a scientific instrument sculpture on the rotunda. Um, but they didn't want that either. So the building holds its own without all those things. But we would have put more elements of communication if they'd let us. Next. And, and there you see just pieces of it. Next. Next. Oh, go back one moment. I've got a secret here. They should have had a bridge here linking across the road, and they changed the plan here. It was, a, it was awful what happened. But the, the architect who saw what we did said, 
well, in fact, that one said he wanted to do it and then the university didn't want to. But very often they say, because Denise says it, we'll do the opposite. So much for guidelines. Um, so it's better to make the things there. So I put here a window and some clever person will say, gee, did you realize that you could actually put a bridge here? So it's there for someone to discover one day. Next. 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 And on the inside, very simple. That's the only kind of atrium we'll ever do. I'm allergic to atria in buildings. I think they get in the way of, of connectivity and they have no use for them. So our atrium is at widest 10 feet wide and parts eight feet wide. It has windows here to rooms that look out onto the green through these windows. So it feels like a very big space, but it's very economical. And then it can be used as breakout space for a conference for this area. Next. Next. And those are the, some of the labs and the, and the coffee lounges. Um, when the building opened, I did a little test that I like to do. I looked for small signs to show signs of activity. And um, one of the tests was to look at all the chalkboards and all the coffee lounges. So there were six stories of labs and one story of administration on the ground. And the six stories of labs um, had, on every chalkboard, there was a, um, th th there was a set of formulae all the things they talked about while they were drinking their coffee. And down on the ground floor, in the administrative floor, there was also a chalkboard, and on it, all it said was, this pot of coffee made at 7.30 a.m. Next. Um, so there's Bob and me as we are today. And that was, um, Tsinghua was one of the last projects I did. I'm working at home. Um, and people are writing to me from all over. I lecture a little, but not much. And um, people come and visit me with interesting ideas from all over. Um, a Las Vegas strip of religious camps in Lagos by a German architect. <laughs> and absolutely fascinating, really fascinating. And so it, it's nice to be able to do that. And they come and they, they spend the morning with me or an afternoon. And Bob... Bob is retired, his memory is not good, he's very happy, he's much less stressed than when he practiced architecture. <laughs> very humorous. And you can see he's smiling. Next. Next. Um, so I'm lecturing. That was the first slide of the lecture about encounters with the palimpsest. You must understand what I mean by palimpsest by now. So I slide Broadway boogie woogie as one palimpsest amongst these others. Next. And of course, the layers of our computer drawing are palimpsests, all on one like that. And look how beautiful, it's like a rosary window. And then of course, there's Broadway Boogie Woogie again. Next. And there's Piazza Navona, which was in fact a Roman circus. And amazing, this is Hurricane Sandy, so that's the way it was. Look at this beach with the people crowded, the pattern of the beach and the pattern of the parking. But this is the same bridge. So this whole area now looks like that. It's down to its palimpsest. It's as if they cleaned the parchment. Next. And telling them about this again. Next. That's, you know, that's a palimpsest of the mind. This is the way I was taught about... Um, about um, putting buildings together. At the AA, they said this was a very cool, very radical departure, Asplund's building and the Gothenburg Town Hall. Now I look at it, I see lots of similarities as well as departures. Yeah, but and it is a beautiful example. And it's funny, at the lecture where I gave this, another architect used the same example. And then um, Bob and I talk about um, matching could be, all, by analogy, gray tie and a gray suit. By contrast, gray tie and a gray suit and red tie. And by um, a mix, um, a, <coughs> a red 
and gray polka dotted tie with a gray suit. And that's the one we liked. And when I described that to Simon Sainsbury in a meeting in the National Gallery one day, trying to convince him of something, he said, Denise, I don't want to hear one more analogy from you. And that night after um, Kirk Finkel and I, some of you know Kirk, he did these, this lecture with me. Um, that night, um, who should appear on television but Reverend Al, whom I admire, with a gray suit and a red tie. <laughs> so we put Reverend Al in from television. And then I love this one for a match. They're both school buildings. They're both four square, with very symmetrical. But this one is a 1914 or so, and that's 1930s. And this is the kind of building that you would find in a school book on, school, of a, on, on towns. This would be the, the town in a, in a picture book for children. Or to be the town, or to be the the school maybe in a toy toy train town, and I often say to people, um, when you when you design a building, think of the generic, think of that toy train town, and think what the building would be in that toy train town. You don't have to do that, but keep it in mind. And I think these two, which sit side by side without either one bending to the other, are really rather wonderful. They're on uh, the outskirts of Philadelphia. They're, they're now a Korean public school. Next. And then another lecture on um, expanding the idea of space. And it's a very, very long lecture, but this is, and I won't give it to you all, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is the notion that of desert space. Yes. Yes, it's going to be, yes. Yes, but I do want to show you this desert space. So this is desert space, and um, from Las Vegas, but I know them from Africa too. Next. And this is showing how people settle desert space. They, this is the measure of man stepping out fields of different sizes, but it could be you, you step out the, the pattern of a temple. So desert space makes you put your own measure as man in a sort of geometric way. And then you can't define it by walls the way you would in Venice. Next. More desert space and how it's defined by monumental simple geometries. Next. Um, that one you saw, it's definition again. Next. Um, another form that the, the town grows out of the desert. Next. M me taking a photograph of myself in the hotel and what happens is I'm hiding the camera over there by the ice bucket and it sends up a halo for me. <laughs> so I'm pre-Raphaelite, which I feel I am. Next. So that's when I'm traveling to Las Vegas. Next. So these are going to be the last ones, the, the slides of Las Vegas, I think. Next. No, those are more a few. Let's go just quickly through these so we have five minutes. Next. Just go ahead. This is <laughs> at Santa Monica. Just do it without my telling you. It's, that's Muscle Beach. I, again, I did a studio on this beach. So I did, got all these photographs for the studio. Look at those. They're like totem poles. Next. Just go on. And that's, of course, Muscle Beach. And then you've seen those more of Las Vegas. I couldn't resist these glistening. They're like... Um, Oldenburg, and that's like Rouché. Just go quickly. I'm going to try to, I'm doing a book on these pictures. Um, we've digitized them all. That's Los, that's Los Angeles. Just go on. It's, it's, now, here, stop. This is Mayhew. Um, Mayhew was a journalist who um, went to the boroughs of London and talked with poor people about their lives and wrote his journals, and Cruikshanks illustrated them. And that was source material for Dickens. But also, it's source material for us as a datum line to see our petition as the same for these women. And a minute later, these women were all smiling. They're at a conference of women in architecture in San Francisco. But the idea is their petition should be analyzed the way Mayhew did his, and with a little help from good social scientists at Harvard, 
hope you can find, get good information from them. And I'll talk later about the petition tomorrow, because there's no time now. Next. And that's it. Um, Bob and I are at home. I told you what we're doing. I think of tomorrow, and I call myself architecture's grandmother. And no one has contested that title. <laughs> um, there's no Pritzker Prize telling me I can't have it. Um, but I did get a letter from someone with a little phrase in Tswana. And Tswana is not an African language I know. And I wrote back saying, what did you say? And he said, love to architecture's grandmother. So it's very nice. And he, um, I, I, I feel that... I'm so happy that this generation is taking up this women's cause and taking up this understanding of the everyday environment and not saying it's all crap, which one architect friend of mine said, why does she like it? Saying it's our reality. We can't say like it or not like it, deal with it. Um, and you may deal with it in many ways, but if you love it, maybe you'll deal with it better. Um, and you are going to go global, and what's that going to mean for you? You're going to like that or not like that. You're going to have many, many ways to take my information and use it for yourselves or find other ways to be responsible in, in that way, and yet to have enormous fun. And the analogy I use is the... Um, I saw a, a bullfighter, and I'm against bullfighting, I, I, you know, but it's the most beautiful thing in the world and the most skilled thing in the world and the most dangerous thing. And you saw him using his hands like this, saving his life by using his hands because he can get the bull where he wants the bull, not on him. And then you, they interviewed him, and he's this young guy, and he is splendid. He's like a Las Vegas sign. And, <laughs> you know, and his... his if we do the wrong thing, our building will fall down. Our um, profession is dangerous too, and we cannot afford to not be holistic. A social scientist can choose what they will research. We have to research what we need to do our design. We are very mandated in that way. So is he. And they said to him, and you want it to be beautiful too? And he said, of course. So we can be splendidly beautiful and still do all our job and use our minds and our hearts. And I hope you'll do all of that. Thank you.